Welcome back. We start our news bulletin from Brazil where 904 more people have died from COVID-19 as the death toll neared 36,000. The U.S. has recorded 749 deaths overnight, taking the tally to over 109,000. Worldwide, the death count has crossed 400,000 with more than 6.8 million infections. Further details in this report. While the world is still reopening a huge number of cases on a daily basis, the WHO says the second wave of COVID-19 is not a matter of if but when. Brazil has removed months of data on its outbreak from public view as President Jair Bolsonaro defended delays and changes to official record keeping. The president, however, accused the World Health Organization of being biased. The WHO backed down, Trump cut money to them, and they went back on everything. There was only one guy missing, and he's not even a doctor. I am moving forward on this. The United States left the WHO, and we are studying this for the future. Either the WHO works with ideological impartiality, or we are also out. We don't need outsiders weighing in on health here. Over in Asia, Indonesia and India have reported record high cases over the past 24 hours. But Sri Lanka says it will open to international tourists from 1st August after a successful containment of the coronavirus. In China, experts say the citywide nucleic acid testing conducted in Wuhan is conducive to its future epidemic prevention and control. We have found all the asymptomatic cases and other potential risks at this point. This will reduce the pressure for our future prevention and control work. South Korea has reported 57 additional cases of the coronavirus, making the second day in a row that its daily count is above 50. Meanwhile, Pakistan has reported a record overnight surge in COVID-19 cases for the fifth straight day as the country's death toll tops 2,000. Over the past 24 hours, 67 people lost their lives while nearly 5,000 tested positive for the virus. The Ministry of Health says the death toll stands at 2,002 with nearly 99,000 cases. It said over 33,000 patients of coronavirus have recovered so far. In another news, Indian forces have martyred three more civilians in the southern Shropian district of occupied Kashmir. The occupying forces have martyred 18 Kashmiri civilians this week alone. Indian forces targeted the Kashmiris in a cotton and search operation in the Reban area. The occupied valley has been under India's curfew and communications blackout for the past 307 days. Pakistan has warned world leaders that New Delhi is using their preoccupation with COVID-19 to step up its suppression in occupied Kashmir. Talks between top generals of China and India to sort the escalated military standoff over the Radakh border have ended inconclusively. In a statement, the Indian Ministry of External Affairs said the two sides agreed to solve the dispute peacefully but did not mention any mechanism to do so. Delegations led by India's Lieutenant General Harinder Singh and China's Major General Liu Lin met at the Chinese side of the border. The statement said both sides will continue military and diplomatic engagements to resolve the issue. The situation in Pangong Zhou on the eastern Ladakh border deteriorated on 5th May. Around 250 Chinese and Indian soldiers were engaged in a violent face-off. The incident was followed by a similar incident in North Sikkim on May 9th. The U.S. has welcomed the Cairo Declaration to resolve the Libyan crisis and end the armed conflict in the country. Egypt's President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi says this initiative includes a ceasefire and will pave the way for elections in Libya. More in this report. As his Libyan National Army faces massive losses to the Turkey-backed GNA forces, General Khalifa Haftar flew to Cairo for support. Al-Sisi backed his ally, announcing the Cairo Declaration to end the years-long civil war in Libya. I would like to point out that this initiative calls for respect for all efforts and other international and United Nations initiative by announcing a ceasefire starting 6 a.m. on June 8, 2020. The initiative also obliges all foreign sides to exit all foreign fighters from all over Libyan land, dismantling all militias and withdrawing their weapons. 
The UN says it wants all sides to participate in good faith to halt the fighting and return to the UN-led political negotiations. Al-Sisi also urged international support for the initiative and called on United Nations to invite Libya's rival administration for talks. He said repercussions of conflict are not limited to Libya but spreading to neighboring countries as well. The state of internal polarization by supporting the unconstitutional government of national accord with more weapons and fighters. It also deepens the state of international and regional polarization around Libya in light of the conflicting interests among most of the countries involved in this conflict. Haftar's rival, the UN-backed government of national accord, has rejected the Cairo declaration saying it has no time for Khalifa Haftar's nonsense. Russia, UAE, Saudi Arabia, Jordan and Bahrain have backed the Cairo declaration. Libya's government of national accord is yet to comment on the development. 26 people, including the chief of a Fulani village, have been killed in an attack in the volatile Mopti region in central Mali. Officials say men in military attire also burned down Benadama village. In a statement, the Fulani Association, Tabith al blamed the attack on Mali's soldiers. It said troops surrounded the village in pickup trucks before killing the villagers and setting houses on fire. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack yet. Human rights groups have also accused Mali's military in the past of conducting extrajudicial killings, kidnappings, torture and arbitrary arrests. Thousands of protesters have taken to streets across over two dozen countries to demonstrate against the custodial killing of African-American George Floyd. In the U.S., protests continue for the 12th straight day as Washington, D.C. security forces blocked any approach to the White House. Similar demonstrations against police brutality and racism are being held in Sydney, Edinburgh, London and Madrid. UK's Met Police said a total of 27 police officers have been wounded so far during a series of anti-racism protests. This report has details. For the past 12 days, the long-standing problem of systemic racism and mistreatment of African Americans and other minorities has taken center stage in the U.S. At the second memorial service in Floyd's hometown in North Carolina, his family members call for an end to police brutality and racism. What's going on in this country? And though my family has been saddened by the news, this is just an allergic reaction to an ongoing issue in the United States. Just like the coronavirus, police brutality has yet to find a cure. It is a difficult time for us all, and we must all come together and come to the front lines to protect each other. These images associated with this will affect all of our lives for the rest of our lives. Not only did we lose a family member, but y'all watched as well, and y'all was helpless too. The incident has also sparked protests across the world as thousands took to streets across Europe, Australia, Japan, and South Korea. In the UK, despite the pandemic fears and government restrictions, tens of thousands staged Black Lives Matter protests across the country. Authorities reported brief clashes in Whitehall, near the Prime Minister's residence at 10 Downing Street. In Italy, a rally by the far-right group and hardcore football fans has turned violent in the center of the capital, Rome. Hundreds of protesters called on the Prime Minister to resign over his handling of the crisis and the damage wrought on economy and jobs. Clashes broke out between demonstrators as one of their representatives began talking to the media. Some demonstrators threw bottles, stones and smoke bombs towards the police, journalists and photographers. Protesters also chanted slogans against media, calling journalists terrorists. Police responded with water cannon and tear gas and made several arrests. This comes as Italy enters its final phase in easing lockdown, allowing dis domestic travel and opening its international borders. In Israel, thousands of Palestinians and Israelis clashed with police during protests against Tel Aviv's plan to annex parts of the West Bank. The protesters were carrying Palestinian flags and banners condemning occupation. Left-leaning Israeli party Meretz leader said the decision by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's government is a war crime. U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders also virtually addressed protesters and expressed his support for the demonstration. He said it is important to stand up to authoritarian leaders and build a peaceful future for every Palestinian 
and every Israeli. While the protesters said Netanyahu's plan blocks the option of a two-state solution. So we are here to protest the idea of the annexation that does not serve Israelis, does not serve Palestinians, blocks the option for a two-state solution, blocks any option for decent life for Palestinians. And it's actually a fiction that serves Trump, serves Bibi, does not serve the people. This is why we are here. Thousands of Lebanese have come out to the main square in Beirut to protest against the slow pace of reforms in the crisis-hit country. The demonstration devolved into clashes after police fired tear gas at rock-throwing protesters. Protesters set fires on main roads and at one point destroyed police motorbikes and set one alight. The Lebanese Red Cross said 37 protesters had been injured, of which 11 were taken to hospitals for treatment. Demonstrations have been taking place in Lebanon since October, demanding solution to the ailing economy and an end to rampant corruption. We have been protesting daily. We have sit-ins on the streets, in front of the Justice Palace, in front of the Ministry of Finance and the Economy. Our problems have yet to be solved. And we have promises, the Prime Minister claims. 97% of the government's pledges have been carried out, but we have not seen even 1% on the ground. Now, it wouldn't be inaccurate to term 2019 a year of rage. During the previous year, there were anti-government protests in Hong Kong, India, Sudan, Lebanon and several other countries. The situation only calmed down when the COVID-19 pandemic forced people back into their homes. Now, the Black Lives Matter movement in the U.S. may be sparking worldwide unrest once more. Further details in this report. 2020 has been a difficult year for humanity so far. The COVID-19 pandemic has already claimed over 400,000 lives with the global economy in tatters. Now anti-racism protests have kicked off in the US with the Trump administration increasingly at odds against large sections of American society. I gotta play my part. My father and my grandfather both fought for civil rights and it's in my blood and just seeing my people fall, it, it just hurts every day and something needs to be done about it. So. Hopefully me coming out here can make that difference. The unrest hasn't remained limited to the US. Black Lives Matter protests have spread throughout the Western world along with East Asia over the past week. Meanwhile, grievances from last year are heating up once more, with protests kicking off again in Lebanon and Hong Kong. At the same time, there is a palpable increase in antagonism between global governments and their people. It is very strange because you can sense that everyone is tired and the situation is very hard, especially the economy. So you can sense that people no longer want to be festive in their protests. People are just angry and I am angry. Economists warn a recession worse than the Great Depression of the 1930s is around the corner. To top it all off, locust invasions in Africa, the Middle East and South Asia are fueling a global food crisis, meaning quashing a revived worldwide protest movement will be much harder this time around. In Mozambique, 13 people have died after a sailboat carrying 50 sank in bad weather off the coast of northern Cabo Delgado province. Police said they are recovering the bodies of victims as well as 35 survivors who are being held for further investigation. The shipwreck occurred south of Pemba, where militants have been waging an insurgency for over two years. The UN estimates more than 200,000 people in the province have been displaced by the insurgency. We're taking a short break, but stay tuned for more news. Welcome back. Germany says relationship with the United States is complicated, regretting the planned withdrawal of U.S. soldiers from the country. Foreign Minister Heiko Maas made these comments in an interview after U.S. President Donald Trump ordered the pullout. Maas said Washington and Berlin are close partners in the transatlantic alliance, but the ties have been marred with problems. Officials said the decision to remove 9,500 troops was a result of months of work by top U.S. military officer General Mark Milley. They said it had nothing to do with tensions between Trump and Merkel, who thwarted Trump's plan to host a G7 meeting this month. The move will reduce U.S. troops stationed in Germany to 25,000 from 34,500. 
Moscow has warned of tit-for-tat measures in response to the Czech Republic's expulsion of two Russian diplomats. In a briefing, Foreign Ministry spokesperson Maria Zakharova said the step is another attempt to compromise bilateral relations. Zakharova said Russia sees the Czech Republic's action as an unfriendly and indecent step. She said over recent years, Moscow had been developing relations with Prague in the humanitarian, economic and political fields. But Prague has deliberately delivered a blow to the Russian-Czech cooperation. The World Bank has warned the COVID-19 pandemic will affect the livelihoods of billions of people across the world. In an interview, Bank President David Melpas says economic fallout of the pandemic can last for a decade. Malpass said over 60 million people can find themselves with about $1 per day to live on. He said the main challenges are the damage to global trade and inclinations to bring supply chains closer to home or erect trade barriers. He said the global economy will become less interconnected after the pandemic, which will create its own set of tensions and inequality. Six Swiss tourist destinations and the Principality of Liechtenstein are opening a property-free hotel this summer. Visitors can book hotel suites without walls and roof and experience the diversity of the region under the stars. Let's find out more in this report. Created by twin brothers Frank and Patrick Ricklin and partner Daniel Charbonnier, the Zero Real Estate project aims to explore traditional approaches to hospitality. The idea is that with zero real estate, we make others the performers by performing the concept of real estate without hotel rooms. A night in the double room costs more than $300, including the services of a white-gloved modern butler, often a local farmer in jeans and Wellington boots. I think the reality of coronavirus plays into this concept. The room without a wall and roof also shows a kind of liberation. There is probably no other place to enjoy a better ventilated room than this during the summer in Switzerland. Bookings have already started for the seven suites, which open from July 1st. In China, tourism is helping lift people in the cliff top village of Atelier in southwest Sichuan province out of poverty. More in this report. Atelier is a famous cliff village sitting high among the mountains in Lingxiangji Autonomous Prefecture's Zhejiang County. Due to its isolated location, perched like the seat of a chair with near vertical cliffs both above and below, villagers must use a series of handmade ladders to scale the 800-meter high cliff. When we were at school, we had to walk about 18 kilometers. We left home early and it would turn dark when we arrived at school. It was very dangerous. The lack of access to the outside had stagnated the local economy. Life in the village gained nationwide attention in 2016 when a Chinese newspaper published a collection of photos. In August 2016, the local government spent 1 million yuan to add a steel ladder with a handrail. After we built the steel ladder, we had access to water, electricity and the internet. Many young people started to play on their phones browse WeChat moments and watch live streams online. The relationship with the outside world is getting closer. Our villagers can walk outside and tourists from outside can also come in. On May 14, some 80 households from Atelier moved to their new homes in the county seat. It is part of a massive relocation project in Zhaoji as China aims to eradicate poverty by the end of the year. Meanwhile, the construction of seven schools and three hospitals around the relocation site is underway. We're taking a short break, but stay tuned for more news. The Kremlin says OPEC plus agreements will have a positive impact on future stabilization of the global energy markets. This comes as OPEC, Russia and allies agreed to extend a cut of nearly 10 million barrels of oil a day through the end of July to boost prices. Talking to the media, Energy Minister Alexander Novak said Russia will produce 510 million to 520 million tons of crude in 2020. The OPEC ministers have bound non-compliant members to make extra reductions in July to September period. The Joint Ministerial Monitoring Committee of the group will now meet every month until December to review the market. Benchmark Brent crude climbed to a three-month high on Friday, above $42 a barrel. 
Gulf stock markets have gained steam after OPEC Plus agreed to a one-month extension of its record output cuts. The buy stocks lead the gains in the region as DFM general index rose about 3%, trimming this year's losses to 24%. Region's largest index, the Dawal in Saudi Arabia, is trading over half a percent higher as oil giant Ramco stocks rose nearly 1%. Bursa Kuwait has gained over half a percent, while Qatar's QE index has also surged over half a percent. Stock markets in Abu Dhabi, Oman and Qatar also gained between 0.2% to over 1.5%. Now let's look at the weather from around the globe. This is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.